Good afternoon. I'm Ross Jones, a physician, Master of the Public Health student, and current Mongan Commonwealth Fund Fellow. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Mark D. Smith. Dr. Smith is a visionary and innovative leader. He is a noted health policy expert whose expertise is sought all over the globe. Dr. Smith holds a BA from Harvard College, an MBA from the Wharton School, and an MD degree from the University of North Carolina. In 2001, Dr. Smith was elected to the Institute of Medicine, where he chaired the Committee on the Learning Healthcare System, which created the widely publicized report on healthcare quality and innovation, best care at lower cost. In his role as founding president and chief executive officer of the California Healthcare Foundation, Dr. Smith not only spurred the foundation into a leader in the fields of healthcare quality and health policy, but his work also helped to improve the health of thousands of underserved Californians. Before I turn the session over to Professor David Williams, who will be moderating today, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Smith to the Voices and Leadership Series at the Harvard School of Public Health. And Mark, we are truly delighted to have you here with us today as part of this Voices and Leadership Series. And we are looking to learn a lot from you, from your own experiences of leadership. I want to begin, though, we've heard the, in the introduction, you were the founding director, president, CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation. And for 17 years, you held that role, and that foundation gave out $500 million um, to help improve the healthcare system. But before we talk about some of those accomplishments, I want to learn a little bit from you about your preparation for leadership. I understand that your academic career began on this campus. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, in some ways, my leadership career began as kind of a student leader in high school and then on this campus. My first two years on this campus, I'm not sure that I excelled in my academic performance, but my leadership performance was good enough uh, to have helped me take over several buildings and do other things that were <laughs> uh, important to student what leaders. What time are we talking about well, so that we, we understand what you're talking about? We're talking 1968. I was a freshman here in 1968, and I spent two years here involved in um, anti-war protests. I was elected to the committee that established the Afro-American Studies Department at Harvard. And eventually I left school and dropped out of school and sent seven years out of school and then came back in 1977. So it took me 11 years to complete my academic career at Harvard, but my parents were awfully glad when I finally did. Um, so I'd, I'd been kind of involved as a student leader actually in high school and then in college and in medical school. And in some ways, all those roles, including my time spent out of school as a political activist, um, prepared me for leadership roles that I would have later on. Tell us a little bit more about the seven years out of school. Where were you? What were you doing? Uh, I moved to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, where I now was. you're from Brooklyn, New I'm York. I'm from Brooklyn, okay. New York, Bed-Stuy, born and raised. Um, Moved to Jackson, Mississippi, where I worked at an after-hours school for black kids in Jackson, the Black and Proud School. I was an activist on college campuses uh, in, in and around Jackson, and I led the first African Liberation Day demonstration in Washington, D.C. in May of 1972, protesting what were then Portuguese colonies of uh, Mozambique and Angola and Guinea-Bissau and Rhodesia and Southwest Africa. And then I worked at a textile mill for about four years. So I'm still thinking of a, a, a young man from Brooklyn in Jackson, Mississippi. That, that must have been a cultural shock. And uh, yeah, that's one way of putting it. Um, a young man from Brooklyn who had just dropped out of Harvard living in Jackson, <laughs> Mississippi. Uh, but it taught me a lot because it taught me a lot about um, the South, where I had never spent any time before, really, uh, other than my one trip to Durham, North Carolina, which is my first taste of segregation with my father. Um, and it taught me a lot about dealing with people of all sorts, uh, people who were well-educated and people who weren't so well-educated, and um, uh, it served me well, I think. And are those lessons that helped you in, in your leadership role? I think so. Uh, you know, I think leaders have to be able to listen. Uh, leaders have to be able to hear uh, sometimes criticism of them. Uh, not everybody uh, uh, will uh, approach you with, uh, with great kindness or, or approval necessarily. And you have to be able to deal with all sorts of kinds of people. And so um, 
that variety of experiences and exposures, I think, was helpful in dealing with people from all walks of life. So from Jackson, Mississippi, you then said you worked at a textile mill and from a textile mill to Harvard. What, what led you to leave working in the textile mill to come back to school? Well, um, <clears throat> let's see, I was 26 years old working third shift uh, at Cone Mills and I was probably making pretty good money at the time, I don't know, $4 an hour, $4.50 an hour, it's one bad money. <laughs> I wasn't sure I wanted to be 36 working in the, in, the, in the card room, and I eventually concluded that I wanted to be a doctor. And um, Why did you want to be a doctor? Well, you know, that's a good question. There was nobody in my family who was in medicine. I hadn't been a candy striper in high school. I <laughs> had no particular love for pathophysiology. But first, it was a helping profession. And second, I think I was interested in the kind of social and economic and uh, political uh, um, issues in medicine and in taking care of people, particularly underserved people. And lastly, frankly, having been kind of an activist and, and suffered the, the coming and going and the volatility of politics during those days, I thought at the time that medicine was based on science and was therefore immutable and would not change uh, with the winds. And so I was looking for something that kind of grounded me in something that was objective and fact and not subject to debate. And in that way, it was more attractive to me than, say, law or some other professions which had some of those attributes but not the solidity, the certainty, the objectivity that at the time I thought medicine had. Okay, so you came back to Harvard. Yeah. They accepted you back. Yes. <laughs> Gracias a Dios. Yes. Okay. They accepted, they accepted you accepted back, and back. and you majored in chemistry or biology as as a for pre med. I actually majored in Afro American studies. I changed my major to Afro American studies, the department I'd helped found, and then I did chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, all those things on my way to medical school. And after eleven years, to the delight of your parents, oh, you finished to your their bachelor's degree. Overwhelming and everlasting <laughs> delight and relief. Yes. And mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so from Harvard you go to medical school where? University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And what was uh, that, that experience like? It was a great experience. I actually got good advice from two professors I had met in taking a social medicine course here who had been on the faculty at North Carolina. I had the opportunity to go there as a Moorhead Fellow in Medicine, which meant concretely that I got to go to medical school without having any debt, which is a no small task, especially for kind of an activist old medical student. Um, <laughs> but they also told me, because I wanted to be a primary care doctor, that they thought I'd get just as good an education, maybe a better education, to be a primary care doctor at Chapel Hill compared to Harvard Medical School. If I wanted to pick apart mitochondria or uh, do those sorts, of, not that they don't do that yeah, at Chapel yeah. Hill, but if that were my path, maybe Harvard would be better. And they said, frankly, you've got Harvard on your resume once, that ought to be good enough. <laughs> so I went back to, to North Carolina to medical school. It was a great experience. Part of what was great about it was that the medical education system in North Carolina requires that students spend part of their clinical time away from the flagship teaching hospital in Chapel Hill and out in secondary but very good community hospitals in places like Charlotte and Raleigh and Wilmington and they have places for students to stay and they have faculty who are trained and paid to teach in those community hospitals and so one got an exposure to a type of medicine which is very different from what most medical students get in kind of the mothership tertiary quaternary hospital and that was a real plus, I think, for the education there. So, Mark, we, we follow in your career. Yeah. Afro-American studies major at Harvard, yeah. lots of experiences in between that, yeah. that help you to learn how to deal with people. you now a physician. Yeah. Where do you go for your residency training? I went to San Francisco General uh, in 1983, in part because I liked San Francisco, nice place, in part because it had a reputation of training people in um, in the care of the underserved, and in part for personal reasons, uh, family uh, to be there. Uh, and I arrived, as it turns out, at the beginning of what we now call the AIDS epidemic, okay. which at the time mm -hmm. was this uh, bizarre and inexplicable phenomenon of young men showing up with these diseases that we'd read about in books but never actually seen. So you had direct experiences like that early in your time in San Francisco? First night on call, uh, and every night after that. And what, we would what did you see? We saw young men uh, with um, 
infections and tumors and skin diseases that uh, were, uh, were medical oddities until just a few months before, and, and they came in droves and it was a holocaust. Wow. And uh, there was often little that we could do for them uh, because we were just learning how to take care of this disease. Uh, we didn't know its cause and so frankly all of us who were taking care of people were scared and our wives and husbands and girlfriends and boyfriends were scared because it wasn't entirely clear how it was transmitted. And um, it was a time of great pain and would be for several years because even as we learned what caused the disease and we learned how to take care of the secondary infections and cancers, we had no treatments. Um, and so it was a wrenching time. And you played leadership roles even as a resident there. Yeah, well, I was the co-chair of the House Staff Union <laughs> at San Francisco General, which meant I got the opportunity to serve on the hospital's executive committee. And that meant I got a chance to see how this institution worked in a way that very few residents do. I mean, most residents stagger in at 6 in the morning and stagger out at 9 at night, and it's all they can do to kind of keep up with the index cards. There were no smartphones back then. <laughs> index cards and kind of flip through the patients. But I got a chance to see kind of how the levers worked in the background, and it spurred my interest in getting further training, this time not in public health. When I went to medical school, it was mm -hmm. with the intention of pursuing a public health degree. Okay. And I think I'm three courses short if there's a dean around. <laughs> um, but I kind of got more interested in the management. Uh, it was a time also when, for the first time, the cost pressures of healthcare were beginning okay. to reach down into the clinical world, and people were just for the first time saying, well, maybe our money is not unlimited. Maybe we'll, ha we'll cap how much we'll pay for your time in the hospital. And so it was time of turmoil, and I elected to get graduate training in management, in part because of my exposure to these issues of running a big, a big complicated institution like I, I want to come back to the management in, in, in a second, but what impact did that early exposure to AIDS have on your entire career? of treating AIDS patients? Well, for most of us, many of us, most of us who trained at that institution at that time, HIV has been an ongoing part of our careers. I still see patients. I still work no, in the No, no, wait. Clinic. Let me make sure. Yeah. You've been a CEO for 17 years, and yeah. before that, the vice president of another foundation. Yeah. You still make time to see patients? I do. Why? Um, well, first, because I like it. Okay. Uh, it gives me a certain satisfaction that um, my other work doesn't. Second, because being a physician who has some expertise in HIV, particularly a black physician, a physician who speaks Spanish, uh, there's a shortage of us in a way that there isn't a shortage of lots of other doctors. Um, uh, third, because um, HIV, particularly for people of my generation, has been this amazing journey of discovery. In part, it's been a social cause because of the people affected, because of the stigma and discrimination always associated with them. But it's simultaneously been this amazing journey of biomedical discovery. So frankly, if my clinical interest had been in hypertension, all due respect, there's not huge progress in hypertension. But the progress that we've made, what we've learned about our bodies, about viruses, about pathophysiology, and about how to treat this particular virus in the last 25, 30 years is nothing short of miraculous. And so it keeps your interest because there's there's always new stuff, and compared to those early days, it's a miracle what we can do. But I would think that spending time seeing patients is taken away from your duties as a CEO. How do you link your involvement with patients to being a leader? Okay, three ways. First, um, being a foundation CEO, my first day at uh, at work, a, a colleague of mine at the time said, welcome to the world of philanthropy. You'll never have a bad meal or a real friend again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, neither of those things is entirely true, but there's some truth to them. <laughs> and so, first of all, seeing patients, it's a group of people with whom I have a different relationship. Not uncomplicated, perhaps, <laughs> but a different relationship. Secondly, it gives you a window on what all this highfalutin policy stuff means to a real actual working doctor and patient. These treatment authorization requests and network designs and all the stuff that sounds so wonderful when you're sitting around a meeting room, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you actually have to live it. 
And thirdly, because I've spent a fair amount of my career telling doctors things they didn't want to hear, and because the first way a doctor will try to discredit you if he or she hears something they don't want to hear is to say, when's the last time you saw a patient? <laughs> As if that necessarily is relevant. And if you could say, oh, about four hours ago, it at least takes that off the table and can have a conversation. So it's actually been, I think, internally, uh, kind of morally, psychologically useful, but it's also, frankly, been substantively useful because you get a sense of how these policy decisions work out in practice, and it's been politically useful because it gives one a certain credibility with clinicians who, like it or not, uh, feel about clinicians differently than the way they feel about non-clinicians. Wonderful. So I see as I, as I think of your whole career as it unfolds, you, you now serve as a physician, you working on the, on the front of the, the, the HIV AIDS epidemic, um, you gain in wonderful experiences. You said you got a management degree as well, which says that you take an advantage of opportunities that you see. And then how did you get into foundation work? Huh. Well, uh, when I finished my training, um, formal training, I went off to Johns Hopkins where I ran the AIDS clinic. I told you HIV part of my career. So I'm at Hopkins. I go as an instructor. I get promoted. I'm writing grants and papers and running the clinic. Good academic. A good, well, um, <laughs> a fair academic. Um, and then an old colleague um, and friend, someone I knew both professionally and personally, uh, Drew Altman, was uh, named the new president of the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation and came calling to see if I would like to move from Baltimore back to the Bay Area to work at a foundation. So the first thing you hear is Baltimore to the Bay Area that sounds like a good idea. But also, um, it seemed to me that this might be an opportunity to have an impact and learn and do stuff that um, my job, as much as I liked it, at Hopkins did not. And actually, a number of my mentors and rabbis at the time told me it would be a big mistake. First, because they said, oh my god, if you, you're at Hopkins. You got an earring, but you're at Hopkins. And so, <laughs> <laughs> if you ever get off this academic track, you'll never get back on, like that would be the worst <laughs> thing in the world, right? But secondly, I think their vision of working at a foundation was that it was something you did after you had been the dean or the provost. It was a way to kind of slip gracefully into retirement uh, and give money to your friends and sip a little sherry along the way and kind of uh, ratchet down. But I knew <laughs> Drew, and Drew was not about ratcheting down. And frankly, I said, it was something of a leap of faith because I, I had worked four foundations but never at and one. And like most people who've never worked at one, I had all sorts of mythology about how they worked. Um, but I said to myself, this is a risk, but I have pretty good training and pretty fair credentials, and if it doesn't work out, uh, you know, I'll be you able to keep body and soul else. together. Okay. Uh, and so I took that leap and um, actually found that I loved the work and enjoyed so it. So what work did you do at the, at the Kaiser Foundation? Well, um, the three things that I did most of were HIV policy okay. on a national level. We see that golden thread of HIV running yep. through. Uh, reproductive health policy um, and what we call the healthcare marketplace. This was the early 90s. It was the beginning of what we now call managed care. And everybody was all up and all, either fabulously enthusiastic or terrified at the promise or threat, depending on your mm -hmm. point of view, of how managed care was going to change the world. And in particular, we tried to focus on these two areas, HIV and reproductive health, and did work around how managed care was affecting both of them. We also did work uh, in a number of policy areas in this country and actually internationally in South oh. Africa as well, mm -hmm. under the leadership of Michael Sinclair, who's now here. Um, so we did a wide variety of things, and actually part of what I liked about foundation work is the fact that to do it well for the most part, particularly at the senior level, you have to pretty, be a pretty good generalist, which is to say, um, as opposed to academia, where the rewards really are going very deeply into a, a narrow area, in foundation work, particularly at a leadership level, you've got to know when you know enough to do what you have to do and then move on or find people who have that expertise as opposed to being able to be an expert in everything yourself. So I kind of like that. It's wonderful. And from Kaiser, you then moved on to be the founder of the California Healthcare Foundation and its leader, and you held that position for some 17 years. Tell us a little bit about your work 
um, at the California Healthcare Foundation, and maybe some of the initiatives. I mean, you are known for innovation, and, and that foundation is known for innovation in, in healthcare. Tell us of some of the initiatives that, that you developed and directed um, at the foundation that you're most proud of. Okay. So first, one slight correction. I'm not the founder. I wish I'd had 500 million <laughs> to just drop in the bank, but founding president. Founding actually, president, okay. Blue Cross and the state of California and the people of California were the founders. And in some ways, this foundation, like some others, is different from many foundations that we know because it doesn't bear someone's name. It's okay. not General Johnson or Mr. Rockefeller or Mr. Ford. It is one of the one of the examples of the creation of these new pots of assets from the conversion of not-for-profit organizations to for-profit organizations. So, you know, I was the first employee and that meant we had a, a mission statement and um, a brokerage account and a terrific first board of directors. Brokerage account with how much money? Well, um, I actually held stock in a company called WellPoint Health Networks, and my first job really was to figure out how to sell the stock and then sell it, and then transfer 80% of the proceeds to our sister foundation, the California Endowment. It's complicated, but in the end... But, but, but I see there not your medical training, but your management training playing a role with looking at this money and trying to decide how you... Well, Divided yeah, up. that's part of what was interesting to me, and frankly, that's part of why I think the board looked at me and my resume and said, hey, here's somebody who could do these things, because they thought having an MBA from Wharton meant you knew something about <laughs> Wall Street, whether you did or not. So in the end, um, our monetization produced about $2.5 billion. So $2 billion went to the California Endowment, and half a billion came to us, and that's what we started with. Um, so over those 17 years, uh, I, with a terrific group of colleagues, built an organization that I'm very proud of and I think has made contributions. I'll give you three programs okay. that I think are, are relevant. First is the CHCF Leadership Fellows Program. We're here talking about leadership. Yes. When I ran the AIDS clinic at Johns Hopkins, I would often wake up terrified that someone would realize that I was a fraud and didn't know what I was doing. I think most clinicians who are in charge of something have that same feeling because healthcare systematically undervalues management, particularly clinicians. It's like they call them suits, right? And that's not a good word. Um, so we decided to have a training program for clinicians who were running something, mainly doctors, but nurses, dentists, pharmacists, respiratory therapists. If you had clinical training but had management responsibility, we wanted to try to help you learn how to lead. So little counting, little finance, how to read a budget sheet, how to nego negotiation skills, media training, a 360 review. Hmm. The kind of thing that any other industry would, would have yeah. invested in you long before mm -hmm. they put you in charge of people's lives and $100 million, right? And so as a result, over the last 12 years, there are some 300 people, several of them are now hospital CEOs, the chairman of the State Assembly's Health Committee, the director of Medicaid, 14 or 15 Kaiser Permanente Physicians in Chief, most public hospital and community clinic chiefs of medicine or medical directors or chiefs of staff. It's been a terrific program giving people support who are in the trenches trying to do all these things that we write about that the healthcare system be should do. Before you give us two other examples, yeah. can you give us a concrete sense of how a different approach to management can change day to day how medicine is practiced? Yeah. Um, I don't want to be pejorative here, but the medical enterprise is 10, 15, 20 years behind many other industries mm -hmm. in terms of the sophistication of the management of both the physical and economic and particularly human resources that we have at our disposal. So I've become a big fan of lean in the last few years. And when you see people who have studied lean, lean, lean? lean management, it's a management okay. technique that comes from the Toyota production system. And it's Here's the thing, it's not instinctive. There used to be a day when if you were a doctor and you were smart, we'd put you in charge of a hospital or in charge of a public health department. And those days are really over. Our institutions are way too complex for people to manage by instinct and experience and empirical. You need, you need methods. And so um, I, I'm, I'm actually encouraged and optimistic that the way out of this 
problem that we have with our healthcare system is in part that you've got talented people who want to take on this very difficult task of shepherding and stewarding the changes that we want the systems mm -hmm. to undergo and managing the people who have to change the way they're doing things. I, I want a concrete example because I want to wrap my brain around it of how someone who's trained, how, how management changes day to day what they do in seeing patients. All right, so one of the grants that we made was to a number of community clinics to try to apply lean management to okay. how they did throughput. Mm -hmm. So any of you who've worked in a clinic operation often know there may be six or seven or eight different exam rooms, and they're all a little bit different, and they're all set up a little bit different. And in one room, the gauze is over here, and in another room, it's over there. One room, the, the tongue depressors are over here, and another room. So that's crazy. Nobody who runs the system has stuff that's different every time you go to, to, to see it. It's just like an operating room. Um, lean management says you, you have the same thing in the same place every time. That means a nurse who's unfamiliar with the operating room won't grab a number 10 instead of a number 5 because in the room down the hall they have the number 5s. They don't waste time looking for stuff. There have been a bunch of studies of people in hospitals that show nurses spend about half of their time looking for stuff, looking for people, looking for <laughs> drugs, looking for, it's, it's amazing. And so no modern institution can meet the challenges that we have to meet in terms of quality, reliability, and affordability without modernizing their management approach. Okay, that's, that that, a concrete that, that's very helpful, that's very helpful. <laughs> right. So one of your contributions is really providing management training for, for healthcare leaders right. um, in, the, in the state of California. Right. Um, you were going to give us two others of the accomplishments that you are proudest of at, at uh, California Healthcare Foundation. Okay, so uh, another is an investment that we made several years ago at the USC Annenberg School of Communication on what's mm -hmm. called the CHCF Center for Healthcare Reporting. Turns out that lots of newspapers that used to maybe have health policy reporters, since newspapers are all losing money these days and their staffs are shrinking, may have a science reporter whose job it is to cover the weather, the polar vortex, the brand new hair replacement uh, uh, thing, the ACA, the, all these things. Uh, and we decided that it would be important to try to figure out a way to help people who read the lay media understand health policy in a way that was relevant to their local situations, and often this would be through the lay press, yeah. and we could help these publications by giving them resources that they would not otherwise be able to have. Mm -hmm. This was a bit of a gamble, frankly, because we didn't know whether the San Diego Union Tribune or the Sacramento Bee would accept having someone not on their staff mm -hmm. doing work for them right. and printing sure. stories in their paper. But it turns out in part because we chose a very talented, very well respected veteran journalist mm -hmm. to lead this effort, that this has had a tremendous impact in terms of local stories that have real impact on policy. So when the, the local newspaper points out that there haven't been investigations in nursing homes that are supposed to happen every year for years and that people are dying, all of a sudden the legislators look up and for whatever set of reasons hold hearings and things actually change. The example of this that people may be familiar with is the kind of Walter Reed phenomenon mm -hmm. where the problems that Walter Reed had been well known so to many VA people hospital, for a long right? time yeah. in, in Army Hospital in D.C., but once there was a series in the Washington Post, all of a sudden things changed. So there have been a number of things you can point to that yeah. have changed because right. the newspapers have accepted this help from the, from the CHCF Center. And the third thing I'd point to is what we call the CHCF Innovation Fund, run by a very talented woman named Margaret Laws, in which we started to invest in companies that we thought could help fulfill our mission. Now most of us have had the experience, perhaps even around here, of an entrepreneurish academic. Mm -hmm. And entrepreneurish academics are different from entrepreneurs okay. in this way. Uh, they're both active and creative and vital and innovative and charismatic. The entrepreneurish academic, when the pilot project is over, writes a paper about the pilot project and then moves on to the next pilot project. The entrepreneur, when the pilot project is over, is trying to find money to build 20 more pro pilot projects and scale this thing so that millions of people can get whatever it is. We need more of the latter. Okay. 
I love the former, they're all <laughs> fine Americans, but <laughs> there is this phenomenon of nonprofit and foundation and government funded innovations that aren't conceived, priced, scaled, built, or led in such a way that they are likely to ever actually become real, breathing, living, dominant things. So we concluded, in part with the help of very smart board members, that by investing in companies whose aims were consistent with the foundation's mission, we had the chance to not only um, help the world get better, but actually do okay for the foundation. Look at it like mm. this. If by the foundation lending you money to get right. your company off the ground yeah. that can, say, reduce hospitalization okay. in public hospitals, mm -hmm and you give us the money back. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were a traditional investor, venture investor, yep. getting your money back is a failure. If you're in the foundation business where That's you big. give money away for a living, if you get your money back, that is Christmas in July. <laughs> That's a huge success. And so, we started to look for and invest in companies that were doing things like trying to improve uh, the chance of having a, a vaginal rather than cesarean delivery in obese women, which has huge epidemiologic implications for the Medi-Cal population, in companies that could reduce rehospitalization of patients who are leaving, in companies that could try to provide actually computer or computer driven mental health interventions for people with minor mental uh, yeah, issues for whom there are simply mm -hmm. not enough professionals available. Mm -hmm. And a wide range, uh, a, a company that does teledermatology mm -hmm. so that it can diagnose and give treatment recommendations for people 500 miles away who may live 100 miles from a dermatologist who will accept Medicaid or who will see you if you don't have insurance. So a wide range of issues where in the end the solution will have to be a commercially viable solution sure. and not a charitably given solution. Right. So that's another, I think, really interesting and exciting area that a number of foundations around the country are now beginning to experiment with because they've had this same experience of having, prom having a graveyard full of promising innovations that never really went much of anywhere, in part because they weren't designed to be able to do that, in part because the people who designed them, though they did a great job, frankly didn't have either the skill set or the interest wow. in having them become commercially viable. Wow. I want to ask you a different kind of question. Okay. I think it's a question that's on the minds of many in the audience. Okay. If you were hiring someone to, uh, as, a, as a CEO of a foundation and you were hiring a promising Harvard graduate in public health you to work for the foundation. You know the tautology, David, all, aren't all Harvard graduates promising, at least? <laughs> okay, we, we, we'll go, <laughs> go with your definition. <laughs> what do you look for? How, yeah. how, how do you identify someone for whom a career in a foundation looks like, like it would be promising that they might be successful? Yeah, it's a great question. And I've uh, been fortunate enough to, to hire some terrific people and been um, human enough to make some awful higher <laughs> decisions as well. Uh, I think the people who do best in foundation work are people who actually have certain breadth and variety of experience. By no, which no, I'm, no, I'm, I just want to make sure I'm hearing this clear. You're not saying specialization. No, not necessarily. Okay. Um, but first of all, I, it is helpful for you to have something that is your calling card. Okay. Specialization in the sense that you have some demonstrated expertise in something. Okay. Uh, it almost doesn't matter what. Sometimes I think people who want to kind of do policy, you say, well, what can you do actually? Can, can you write legislation? Can you run a clinic? Can you um, administer a grants program? Or is, is your definition of doing policy just you kind of like to be in charge of something, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I think it is important to have, I want to distinguish specialization from expertise. Yes. I think it's important yes. to have some expertise because it kind of demonstrates some generic competence. Right. Um, but my experience has been that people, because foundation work involves necessarily interaction with the government, mm -hmm. 
interaction at least in health with the provider community, sure. interaction with the nonprofit community, interaction with the media. It's helpful for you to have some experience that allows you at least a modicum of comfort in dealing with all those. If you are terrified by academics who throw F statistics at you and you just get bullied when a grantee comes in, you will not do a good job. If you have all kind of ideological ideas about the government, positive or negative, that doesn't allow you to work with colleagues in government and be realistic about both the potential and the limitations of government, then you won't be effective. If you don't have some sense for how the media works and what projects are likely to be newsworthy and which ones are likely to be snoozers as far as the media is concerned, you probably won't be effective. And so my experience is that people who've had who have some academic preparation, yeah. who've had some time in government, who've had some time in the provider world or in the consulting world or in the management world. And even time in the mill, right? Even time in the mill. Yeah. All, it's all data, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, my sense is those people bring a certain, uh, uh, a certain plasticity yeah. and a certain ability to be a good generalist, yeah. flexibility that you have to have. So I've hired people who were terrific reporters who made lousy foundation officers okay. or terrific legislative staff or terrific academics who had already been so optimized <laughs> for that function that they couldn't kind of get out of whatever the limits of that function were. So I guess my suggestion, if you want a career in philanthropy, and then I'm going to caution you about wanting okay. one, but if you want a career <laughs> in philanthropy, is that your best preparation is to, is to have exposure to a variety of sectors that allow you to deal with them okay. successfully and to have um, evidence of your professional competence and network uh, through writing or through uh, leadership of professional organizations or in some other way that allows me to in, uh, uh, imply that if you haven't okay. done foundation work before, you'll be able to be successful because okay. you can communicate okay. well and there are people who will respect you. Okay. Now, having Your said caution. that, my caution is that you know I've had a wonderful and uh, rewarding and I'm very grateful for my career in philanthropy. It's not something that I started off planning. It's not like I sat there and said, hmm, a foundation job and frankly <laughs> the number of jobs in foundations is really vanishingly small so compared to the number of jobs in public health departments or provider systems or even academic institutions so there's a fair amount of luck involved as there is in most professional mm -hmm. success even more in sure. foundations because the N is just that much That's smaller so in my career, there's a fair amount of happenstance of who I happen to know and where I happen to be at the right time. And sometimes that will come together for people, but I'd, I'd be cautious about having your heart set on doing this, which is not if you think it's the right career that you shouldn't strive to do it, but the reality is there are only but so many jobs yeah. in that sector compared to other sectors where people who are appropriately prepared might find rewarding and interesting work. Yeah. And I would also say that just from listening to, to your story, uh, to me another really important lesson is making the most of the opportunity where you are. Absolutely. Um, is, is crucial. Now, this has been lots of fun for me. I have a million more questions, but I don't want to be selfish. <laughs> so we have a wonderful audience here, and I certainly would like, I see, I see a hand. We want, want to have some questions from the audience. Yes. Just stand and introduce yourself. And All right. Uh, so my name is Leo. I, um, I'm a graduate from HMS and HSBH. And thank you very much for being here and sharing your journey with us. So I got a question. There's a professor here uh, called Jim Conway. And he teaches a class um, called Leading Change. And, and so he also says that we all suffer from being human. And part of suffering from being human, um, it, it implies that, you know, sometimes people will resist change. And so I would like to see your, you know, your opinion and your insights on how did you deal with people who were resistant to change, and what are some tips for us, you know, who will go out there to the world and try to change things? Yeah. First of all, I know Jim Conway well and have great respect for him. He was a member of the committee on which I served, um, and he's right. And p people um, don't change um, easily sometimes. So. I don't know that I have any great um, that I have any great searing lessons. There's a lot of written on this. I I, th I think it is worth going back to this this issue of listening. Um, so often I think we start from what our priority is rather than the priority of the people that we're working with. And often my experience has been that 
if you at least understand what it is somebody wants to hold on to, you have a better shot of understanding how you can get them to let it go, in part because maybe you can give them something that substitutes. So I'll, I'll give you an example from yeah. lean work. So uh, this lean thing doesn't come easily to many doctors. And sometimes what you hear is, my patients aren't cars, my patients aren't widgets, they're all individual, get out of here with that management nonsense. Some colleagues at Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle who lead the primary care work said they knew that their colleagues had bought into the method when the method was able to solve a big problem for primary care docs, which was at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they were done. Most primary care docs, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, your day has just started. You got a pile of phone calls to return and refills to do and things to check off and authorizations and all that kind of stuff. And by establishing a method that was able to feed the doctors these little snippets in little interstices in their schedule bit by bit during the day, five o'clock when their last patient was done, they were done. So now that's not why they established the method. They established the method principally to kind of regularize and improve patient care. But by trying to figure out what problem you have, how I can solve your problem along with my problem, I can get you to buy into what it is I want to do. So I guess, again, I don't know if this is any brilliant insight, but if you want someone to change, you must have some reason for wanting them to change. You might want to start with, well, what problem might you solve for them? since you're solving a problem for yourself. Uh, maybe there's some problem you can solve for them that's consistent with the change you want to, to adopt. And in some ways that really is, you know, as old as just putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and trying to understand what they're dealing with. I have another example, I don't want to go on too long, but this is this leadership thing and yes. doctors were sure. at this very uh, strange point, I think, in history in healthcare. Um, I am a big believer in systematic care in systems of care, in evidence-driven medicine, which some practitioners have labeled cookbook medicine, and it's one of the things that I think where modern health systems find the most resistance from physicians who are holding on to autonomy. See, because a lot of us were trained to value autonomy. It's been an important part of my first week in medical school, some dean congratulated me for having chosen the last profession in America where nobody could tell you what to do, right? A lot of the people who are doctors are doctors in part because they value individual autonomy. They don't like organizations. They don't want to be part of one. They don't want to have someone tell them what to do. So it's part of their DNA and it's an attribute of their profession that they cherish. And when they hear you talking about guidelines and evidence-based medicine and organization, they hear that as a threat to their autonomy, which they associate with a high degree of professionalism and the kind of care they'd like to deliver. And I think as opposed to just telling them they're wrong, get over it, go away, you, you might say, so I understand why you uh, feel that way. That's the way we were trained, and I understand and value and celebrate your desire to feel personal accountability and responsibility for the care your patients receive. That old method gave you no information about how you were doing, gave you no benchmark data for how you compared with your colleagues, gave you no way to quickly and, uh, and scientifically compare how you approach this patient with the best evidence in the world. Why would you want to practice like that? Um, you want to provide high quality care. We're trying to deal with the complexity in the modern biomedical world that requires different methods to allow you to do what you went into medicine to do. Now, I don't know that that's exactly the right speech, but I guess what I'm saying, as opposed to say autonomy is bad, there's a part of the autonomy that you want to try to um, unite with and kind of uh, give people a way to solve the problem that they have. End of, end of rant. Wonderful. Another question? See ya. Hi, I'm Lisa Fitzpatrick. I'm a physician. I um, also was at CDC for many years working in public health. And now I'm here in the mid-career program at the Kennedy School. 
And only after listening to you did I realize Marsha Martin has been trying to connect me with you. I don't know if you know her, but she's in, <laughs> uh, from Oakland, and she also works in D.C., yeah. and she's been talking about you for a long time. So I'm really glad I got a chance to come uh, and listen to you. Uh, but my question is about um, what you think about the trends we're seeing in mobile health care, mm -hmm. specifically being able to contact a doctor over the internet and have someone dialogue with you and diagnose you um, over the internet and what implications does that have for um, the cost of health care? Okay. So I think it is a fantastic and long overdue uh, coming of modern information technology to health care. Uh, like all technology, it will have some unintended consequences and there'll be some downsides. But if you stop and think about it, Ours is the only service industry whose basic infrastructure looks pretty much like it did 30 years ago. You don't shop the way you shopped 30 years ago. You don't make travel arrangements. You don't bank. You don't do research. You don't get your news and information. We don't do anything the way we did 30 years ago except go to the doctor. <laughs> So there are new machines in the doctor's office, but the informational infrastructure, the basic core of our interaction with the system looks pretty much like it did when Medicare and Medicaid were passed. We're, we're, we're getting there, and there's HIPAA, and there's all these kind of things to, but, but I happen to be a member of Kaiser Permanente. I email my doctor. If I have a lab test, I get my results on my phone that day. That's the kind of customer service we've come to expect from other aspects of the service industry. And soon, if your system can't provide that kind of customer service, your patients will walk to a system who can. You wouldn't bank with a bank that says you must come into the bank to get your money. You gotta come see a teller between <laughs> nine and three to get your money. What are you, crazy? So my sense is that the market will force providers to begin to move into the 21st century in terms of the level of accommodation to patient convenience as opposed to our convenience. For everything from where we're located to what hours we operate to how we communicate with each other. So I think it's long overdue. In many ways, the, the retardation of that has had to do with the fact that our reimbursement system um, uh, is an obstruction. So to the extent that for most hospitals, doctors, people in the business, you're still paid on the number of times that the turnstile goes around. And so why would you adopt a technology that will decrease your own payment? Nobody in his right mind would do that. To the extent that we change our reimbursement, this so-called volume to value switch, where all of a sudden my doctor's saying, well, yeah, I'd rather do an email, then take up a nurse's time, a receptionist time, a parking spot, um, the utilities, and 15 minutes of my time to tell him his, tell him his, his hemoglobin A1C is normal, that's insane. Uh, it's sane if you only get paid if I come in to see you. So one of the big things that's happening in healthcare now is this big kind of tumult around changing the reimbursement system, and to the extent it changes, it will accelerate the adoption of modern IT in healthcare in a way that we've just come to expect it's a normal thing with most of the way we live our lives. Does that make sense? Yes. I see another hand in front. Hi, my name's Luke Allen. Okay. Microphone, please. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name's Luke Allen. I'm an MPH student in global health here. Um, my question is, how are your roots in community organizing and advocacy manifest in your work today? <laughs> um, well, that's a great question. Well, first, um, we all, we're all being trained every minute of our lives whether we know it or not. And so you've heard a little bit about how I spent my teens and 20s, and uh, to the extent that I have some public speaking ability, um, that's in part because I tell my son all the time, you, you want to get to do it well, you do it a lot. The more you do it, the better you are at it. And so that's one of the things that I learned how to do. I also hope I learn how to listen. I have friends who help get me better at it all the time. Um, I also think there's some level of kind of this, this, my HIV continued work is in part a question of kind of social commitment that it comes from those same roots. Um, and in many ways, 
interestingly, I think some of the things I learned doing organizing are very consistent with things I learned in business school. For me, frankly, business school was a much more interesting intellectual experience than medical school. Because much of medical school is kind of memorizing, you know, this bone's connected to that bone. Business school is like, these people buy Reeboks and those people buy Nikes. Why? You know? <laughs> well, What's up with that? Um, how is it that these organizations, these groups of people that have an org chart, also have kind of a shadow org chart? You know, there's the formal structure, then there's an informal structure of how th every organization how th has how things really work in the organization, right? So that's kind of endlessly interesting, but not unlike what one does when you're trying to figure out how do we get the students to vote for an Afro-American Studies Department. So. Uh, that's the best I can do. <laughs> Another question? Hi, my name is Rebecca Gurevich. I'm in the two-year master's program in health policy and management here. Um, thank you so much. This has been really interesting. Um, I wanted to talk or ask you about, um, you speak about the importance of connecting with physicians and how you have continued to see patients in order to sort of maintain that credibility. Mm -hmm. For those of us who are not physicians, mm -hmm. um, who are aspiring to roles in similar types of organizations or in government, What's your advice for sort of gaining the trust of the provider community if you don't have that clinical background to, um, to you know, relate? On? Yeah. Well, I think it depends a lot on the context. My sense is that m most of the health systems that I've seen that where things work well, um, management has learned how to partner with clinician partners. So I can think of two or three hospitals that are really very well-run hospitals whose administrators are not physicians. Now, for some of them, they've been there 10, 15, 20 years. They've developed relationships. They've developed trust. But another technique is, you know, every function has a clinician and non-clinician lead. And it is the two of them that together uh, do the work that manages both the clinical and non-clinical staff. So I, you know, I think it's not imperative for you to be a clinician to lead clinicians. I think it's imperative for you to have someone who is a partner who has that kind of credibility. And I think a lot of that will depend on whether you're running a public health department or in a hospital or in a foundation. Most of my colleagues at that foundation and in most health foundations are not themselves uh, physicians and I don't think necessarily have to be. My first boss at a foundation and friend and mentor and teacher and still the president and CEO of the, Calif of the Kaiser Family Foundation is not a physician. He does a terrific job. So I think, um, I, I do think it's important to recognize that that's going to be an issue in some settings and to respect um, th that kind of perspective in people and learn how to partner with folks who can be broad-minded. We have time for one last question. I see someone right up front. Hi, I'm Ellerington. I'm at the School of Public Health. I'm also a Mungan Commonwealth Fellow in Minority Health Policy. I'm an OBGYN at the core, and therefore I wanted to ask what parameters were you able to decipher to move forward to uh, safety for the uh, morbid uh, pregnant gravity? Uh, <laughs> you didn't talk about that, and I'm, I want to know I'm where we to. are with that. It's, um, one of the lessons of venture investing is that most of your investments will fail. And that's one that failed. <laughs> so we were investing in a company that had a technology that could improve uh, detection of fetal distress in women who were obese. And you know something about the relationship of obesity to socioeconomic status. So I can't remember the exact metrics, but if you could reduce the C-section rate, and since C-sections are related to inability to hit monitor fetal heart rates, if you could increase detection of heart rates, you could decrease C-sections. I can't remember the exact statistics, but it was something like if you could reduce the C-section rate in Medi-Cal deliveries in California, you'd save $50 million a year, some amazing number. And so we made an investment in a pre-FDA technology, which failed. Sorry. <laughs> Um, and I can, there, there's some actually really interesting stuff, uh, and I'm glad to talk with you about some lessons of venture investing in health, which I've learned the hard way, even as a kind of an impact, a socially motivated venture investing. But um, 
That's the reality is that venture investors, if they make 10 investments, eight of them will fail. Uh, one may do okay and one will be a blockbuster and that's how they make their money. Mark, I, ha I have a question for you that maybe comes out of my own work. You know, one of the things I did a long time ago was served on the Institute of Medicine Committee that produced the Unequal Treatment Report yeah. that documented pervasive racial ethnic inequalities in the quality and intensity of care. Yeah. What, from your perspective of looking at innovation within the healthcare field and looking at improving quality, what, what are the lessons that we can learn for addressing this really important problem in the United States? Right. So I would cite two. One is the importance of reliable care based on evidence. So some of the variation that we see about how black people are treated versus whites or Latinos versus non-Latinos or gay versus straight is a subset of all sorts of irrational variation in healthcare. We've learned from Jack Winberg, white women are treated differently in one town versus another. So in some ways, the answer to all those is the same. It's to try to have scientifically based, evidence-based ways of taking care of people, which you customize as necessary for individuals, but take it out of the hands of the individual variation that goes on in individual providers' minds, which was responsible <laughs> both for some of those inequities and others. The second is the importance of a field that's getting more and more attention, which is so-called patient-centered outcomes. Because after all, I, I, I don't presume to know what all Latinos want, or what all Native Americans, or what all women want. Each of them is individual. So the fact of the matter is our system for all patients is still largely driven by outcomes that providers consider important. And we're just now beginning to ask the question, what is it that patients think is important about labor and delivery, or about cancer treatment, or about a prostate operation? What are the patient outcomes that are relevant? To the extent that we can figure out how, what those right questions are and ask them, we will get much deeper insight into meeting the needs of all people, regardless of their SES or ethnicity, because we basically categorize people according to their phenotype. You know, are you a male or a female? How dark are you? How old are you? But in this room, there are six or seven other axes by which we could categorize you. How risk averse are you? How self-confident are you? What's your level of health literacy? And where you fall on that axis may be more important to your clinical care than whether you are black or white. So I think as we get better about finding the right questions for centered, patient-centered outcomes and asking them and then tailoring care for patients, we will do a much better job of overcoming some of these troubling and persistent um, disparities in care. Thank you. Mark, we've got 30 seconds left. You served recently at a very influential Institute of Medicine committee. Could you tell us maybe one key take home message in 30 seconds that we should learn from that committee's report? Yeah, the key message is that many of the problems in healthcare are the result of the unintended consequences of our successes. If our doctors cannot by themselves manage all the diagnostic and therapeutic options, it's because we've been successful in developing a lot more. If we need to have a more modern approach to managing our institutions, it's because they've grown so big and complex, we need science to it. So that should give us cause for optimism. Rather than starting with the premise, everything is all broken, everything is all messed up, we have to start from scratch, which we policy wonks often do. We should say, you know, we've got a lot to celebrate. We've got a lot of successes, and we can build on them to correct the unintended consequences of where we've done stuff really well. Dr. Mark Smith, this has been a fascinating conversation. Please join me in saying a big thank you to Dr. Mark Smith for a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.